Yep. Hey, how's it going? Um, my name is Max Rebholtz. Good evening. I work for Missoula County Office of Emergency Management. Uh, my title is Wildfire Preparedness Coordinator. So I work with individuals and communities to help reduce uh, wildfire risk on private land. Um, and ensure communities are aware of resources within Missoula County to help accomplish uh, fire mitigation. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of first talk about some trends that we noticed uh, this spring and uh, what we've done to some activities that we've done to help prepare for wildfire season and some actions that people can take during wildfire season to uh, better stay prepared and, and informed. Uh, so earlier this spring, we noticed a pretty big uptake in escaped debris burns compared to years past. Uh, so escaped debris burns are essentially uh, people burning piles of vegetation on private property that were ignited and then escaped and thus required uh, fire department assistance to help put out those escape burns. So we did some messaging about that, about safe outdoor burning. And uh, since then, and I think the, the weather shift, we have noticed a lot less uh, escape debris burns. Um, speaking on the weather shift, it's not official yet, but we do expect to move into high fire danger on Monday. Uh, again, not official yet. A press release will be sent out if and when we do. Um, but with that move, that anticipated move in the high fire danger, that would also um, close the outdoor burning permit outdoor burning by permit uh, for the season until the fall. So again, not official yet, it's anticipated, but if and when we do move, uh, a press release will be blasted out throughout the Missoula County community. Um, so some activities that we've done so far this year, this uh, earlier this spring, we've been really focusing a lot of our outreach efforts um, on the west end of the county, specifically the Blue Mountain and Hayes Creek areas. Um, We've been focusing our, our outreach efforts in those areas of town, um, mostly just due to the fact that the fire risk in that area is a little bit more elevated due to our weather shifts, mostly come in from the west and uh, that area experiences a little bit more uh, lightning ignitions. Um, and uh, the outreach that we mostly do is promoting the Home Wildfire Risk Assessment Program. Um, this is a free program for all Missoula County residents. Um, it's essentially a fire mitigation specialist from the local fire department, uh, the DNRC, the county, or the Forest Service would visit with a landowner on their property or homeowner, um, both rural and urban uh, homeowners, and just advise them on ways they can better uh, reduce their structure's ignition potential from wildfire. Uh, it's a great program. Again, it's free. Um, there's you know, there's no risk in, in doing it, I guess. It's just more of uh, some guided actions that you can take to better prepare. Um, to sign up, you can go on the DNRC website uh, to sign up for that, or I can um, put the link in the chat here in a little bit. Um, but when you uh, sign up online or you can call uh, to sign up as well, if you don't have access to the internet, um, someone will be in contact with you within one to three days to schedule an appointment. Uh, another reason why we focus a lot of our outreach in the Hayes Creek area this year is because the uh, Missoula Ranger District is playing a pretty large scale fuel reduction project in that area. And so we just want to complement those efforts that the Forest Service is doing on public lands and reducing wildfire risk uh, by incentivizing, encouraging landowners to reduce their risk and then creating a landscape in which both private land and public land is being uh, concurrently being treated. And another activity that we did this year is we did a uh, fire simulation drill in the Hayes Creek area. Um, basically, we just had like a mock fire on the landscape uh, and we have modeled uh, wind speed, wind direction, fuel moisture, and then we brought in uh, structure protection specialists in training to go out through the Hayes Creek community and assess uh, about 122 homes for their defensibility. Um, we found that almost 75% of the homes in that area were deemed defensible, which is a really good number to have. 20% um, of that 75% were defensible standalone, which is the category that we really want to strive to get to. And defensible standalone just means that the structure could uh, have a higher odds of surviving a wildfire with little to no uh, resources being on site. And in fact, 
um, a firefighter could use utilize the structure or utilize the property rather um, as a safety zone in the event the fire front actually passed through the area. So we're trying to get to homes uh, to get this, to the category of defensible standalone. Um, that's the overall goal. But so anyways, we did that fire simulation drill up in Hayes Creek this year. We had great participation from the community up there. Um, there were about 50 wildland firefighters from all, all over the nation that participated in that event. Um, so that was a that was a pretty good activity that we did. Um, and I just want to bring the light to some of the resources that we have uh, for Missoula County residents to help accomplish mitigation on their land. Um, so there's two programs out there, or there's really three programs out there um, that the county sponsors. Uh, one is offered through Missoula Rural Fire Department, where it's 300 bucks a day. And if you live within Missoula Rural Fire Department's jurisdiction, um, a crew of four firefighters will come to your property and you know cut down some hazardous trees or flammable but remove flammable vegetation on the property and help improve the defensible space of the structure and the property um, again it's 300 bucks a day they, they can fall some pretty technical trees um, really good service uh, they're still looking for a few landowners um, that are interested in signing up uh, another program exact same cost same sort of program is offered in frenchtown frenchtown rural fire department offers a, a similar program, same cost, like I said. Um, and then we, Missoula County Office of Emergency Management, we have a grant as well, it's a cost share grant, where if, again, if you're living within Missoula Rural Fires Jurisdiction or French Town Rural Fires Jurisdiction or anywhere within the county, really, um, if you choose to have uh, mitigation work done on your property, Essentially, if you hire a contractor to do the work, like a, whether that's a landscaping contractor or a forest management uh, contractor, um, the grant will pay for 50% of the cost with the remaining 50% coming from uh, the homeowner's share of it. So all three of those programs are, are very effective. There's others out there. Um, if there's any questions about how to uh, mitigate property or just how to um, be more in the know of some of these resources. I'll post a link in the chat for people to uh, be directed to and then you can learn more about um, some of those resources there and get a hold of me and I can walk you through a little bit more details. Um, and then the last little bit is, uh, you know, during wildfire season, um, just remind you to stay vigilant of current fire restrictions. We're not quite there yet, but it's shaping up to be a, a pretty big fire year across the West. Uh, I encourage everyone to follow Missoula County Fire Protection Association, which is MCFPA on, on Facebook, if you're connected like that. Um, we'll be posting current up-to-date fire restriction information, fire danger rating status, um, information about nearby local fires, along with the Lolo National Forest Facebook page, Missoula County Sheriff's Office, and Missoula County OEM Facebook page. Recommend following uh, those trusted news sources to stay uh, most current and up-to-date with um, Missoula County area fires that are occurring. Uh, also, you know, remind folks, if you aren't signed up already, this is a great time to sign up for Smart 911. Smart 911, it, it's a free service, um, and it's the easiest way for officials to notify residents of when an evacuation warning or or order will occur. So in Missoula County, we utilize a two-stage evacuation protocol. It's either evacuation warning or evacuation order. And an order can be issued with no prior warning. And one of the methods that we use to notify folks of either the warning or the order is through Smart 911. So you go online, Smart 911, you can Google it. I'll also post a link in the chat. Uh, you fill out a safety profile, and then if an evacuation occurs in, say, in, in a given area in the county, uh, we can notify folks via their cell phone, their email, landline phone that an evacuation warning or order is there. Another style of evacuation notification is, um, you know, the sheriff the sheriff's department going through the neighborhood and door knocking and notifying folks to leave. 
Um, but yeah, smart nine one one is definitely the the easier option, and it's just it's a good idea to have even without um, evacu wildfire evacuation or evacuation in mind. I mean, anytime you make a call into nine one one, your safety profile will be populated uh, regardless of where you live or where you're at in the country. And um, responders would then know if maybe you or someone has, you know, a history of uh, cardiac health or something like that, for example. So um, I went through that kind of quick, but I uh, those are some activities that we've done this spring. And you know, it's getting hot out there. We expect to move into high fire danger, but um, when we do, there'll be a a press release officially announcing that. Anticipating to announce that on Monday of next week. And I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thanks, Max. Thanks, Max. Sorry about, about that. Echo. Echo. Oh, any I questions? Looks like Lee Bridges has her hand up. Hi, Max. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. OK, I just want to say thank you to, I think it was the highway department that came through and mowed the interstate yesterday or the day before a couple days ago um, that's the first time in a few years I recall them doing that and I know that in East Missoula here our east our interstate is our major concern with cigarette burning and everything especially with the heat coming on and the fire season that we're heading into so I just want to say kudos to whoever that agency is that did that I don't recall them doing it in previous years recently so I ran out and thanked whoever I saw on the mower the other day and um, was very, very grateful that they did that. Yeah, that's that's good to hear. That's awesome. Um, I didn't necessarily coordinate that, but that's that's good to hear that that's going on. So yeah, good to know. Yeah, that's critical. For sure. Any other questions for Max? Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so real quick, I just I posted that link in the chat, and that's how you get connected to the resources. And you can also sign up for Smart MM1 through that link as well. But that's kind of all things, uh, all things wildfire there from Missoula County. So yeah, thank you www.wildfirepartnersmissoula.org if anyone's on the phone. Um, thank you. Okay, Willem and Cindy. Hi, I'm Cindy Kennedy. I'm a grants administrator in CAPS. And Wilhelm, Willie Welsenbach with Newfields is with me. And I am going to try to give you a little presentation, see how we do this. Um, just a short PowerPoint and hopefully it cooperates with me. Are you seeing my screen? Yeah. Yay. OK, so um, Willie and I have been working on a Brownfields program that uh, in Missoula County and we um, we pre we presented to this group before and we just wanted to provide an update and let you know where we're at and, and the successes that we have enjoyed um, as we have uh, developed this program. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what brownfields are and then I'll talk a little bit about our assessment grant and the sites that we have addressed and then we're hoping to apply again for a second round of funding um, based, you know, kind of piggybacking on the success we've had with this first grant. Um, before I go any further, I'm going to let Willie tell us about what these dots on this map represent. Sure, and can you go to that second slide? I am at the second slide. You're not seeing it? I don't know if other people are seeing it. I'm still just seeing the first one. Yeah, just the title slide. Did that move it forward for people? Nope. No. Uh, we can move it individually, or at least I can. That's bizarre. So you're not seeing the slides advance? No. Why is it doing that? Do I have to do it in here? There you go. That's the second. Very slide. strange. 
we got the presentation there summary now. So, yep. There we, there go. we go. That is different. It's on the screen. That's a new development in, um, in, in Teams. Teams. <laughs> my apologies. So I can see it just fine on my end. All right. All right. So, Willie, go ahead. Talk about the dots. Can people see yeah, that? Yes, so this is the map that some people may have seen, which is the outline of the county and then a bunch of dots and then a little red squiggle on the inside which is the city limits. The dots are each inventoried potential brownfield sites. So we have a few in all the different populated areas of the county. Um, and that's just a depiction of you know, the potential scale of sites. We do have a figure later of the sites we've worked on. And hopefully we'll expand outward from the Missoula urban core or general urban area. Thanks, Willie. So first of all, I want to define a brownfield site. Um, you may have heard this from us before, but just to remind you all. So a brownfield site is real property, the expansion, redevelopment, or reuse of which may be complicated by the presence or potential presence of hazardous substances, pollutants, contaminants, controlled substances, petroleum, or petroleum products, or is mine scarred land. And brownfields can adversely impact human health, decrease the value of surrounding properties, deter potential investments, and they can be a safety hazard. And Willie's gonna talk about this image on this slide as an example of a brownfield. Sure, a lot of towns have buildings like this. It looks like from the shape of the windows and doors on the right-hand side that those used to be roll-up doors that were then converted into some sort of office. And written in the window, it says estate sale. So someone has inherited this building and they're trying to get rid of it. That's a typical brownfield site, something that used to be have a light industrial use, then no longer is used that way. And the people who inherited are having a hard time selling it. These can end up being blighted and just a problem for business and the appearance of a small town. Thanks, Willie. So out outcomes of Brownfields redevelopment can result in job growth, increased housing supply, uh, protection of human health and the environment, additional redevelopment nearby. So brownfield redevelopment can spark more re redevelopment in the surrounding areas, uh, increase local tax base and eliminating eyesores and safety hazards um, or blighted properties like Willie mentioned. So the images in this slide might look familiar to some of you and I'll let Willie explain what, what is on this slide. Yeah, you can see the baseball stadium and the Clark Fork River at the top of each of those two images. And this is the flagship success in our local area. Those who've been around a while know this was the former champion mill that was shut down in the 90s. And for a while, there were just abandoned mill buildings there. There was a fire there. There were some large piles of wood waste. And then recently we had Wyoming Street go through that site after Brownfield's assessment that was done in collaboration with the city's program. Mm -hmm. And uh, Riverfront Park put in a new boat launch takeout um, put in. And those of you who are really familiar with the site and go by there know there's even more large commercial buildings going in along Wyoming Street than are even shown on this 2019 photo. And it's served to connect that whole neighborhood. Thank you. So as I mentioned, um, Missoula County successfully applied for and received a Brownfields assessment grant from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Um, October 2019 is when that grant was awarded. It's a three-year grant and it's $300,000. Uh, we have pretty much spent down that grant. Uh, we will not be using it all the way through September of 2022. So now we're eligible to apply for more funding. Um, and for us to be successful, we had some steps that we had to follow. So first we developed inventories of brownfields, then we prioritized those sites, and we involved the community through the entire process, including this group and lots of other groups in the county um, to really help us identify sites. And it worked because we were able to perform um, phase one and phase two site assessments. Just, just to give you 
um, some background on what a phase one and a phase two site assessment is. So phase one is mostly research about a particular property, um, looking at old fire maps, looking at um, databases, uh, interviewing lots of people, talking to owners, talking to previous owners, neighbors, really doing a lot of research about that particular site to identify how it's been used in the past to help us understand if there is any potential environmental concern that needs to be addressed. And if we do find an environmental concern, then we will do a phase two site assessment and that's where we're going to be collecting samples, um, soil samples or paint samples, whatever the case may be sending them off to a lab and having them analyzed and then writing a report. And so sometimes those phase two site assessments can be very complex and very large and very expensive. Um, so that's been really exciting. We've been able to do some of both phase ones and phase twos. Um, we can use the grant to develop cleanup and reuse plans, uh, but we really haven't used this grant that way this time. But certainly if we're successful in the future, we could use it that way. We cannot use the funds um, to cover the cost of cleanup. So, so far the sites that we've assessed, um, we've assessed some private, privately owned sites, publicly owned sites, and um, a site owned by a nonprofit. So private sites that we've assessed, uh, Coal Mine Road Gravel Pit, which is on the north side of the Scott Street Bridge, and that is owned by Montana Rail Link. And we did an assessment for WAM Missoula, which is a development company in uh, Missoula. They had a property that they acquired around the courthouse that they wanted us to assess. And then Salmon's Transportation, which is out by um, Flynn Lane and, and Broadway. And that one involved a phase one and a phase two. And then the city of Missoula asked us if we would help them with a couple of sites. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to do phase one and phase two assessments at the former Montana Water Company, Missoula Water, and the Roger Street Complex. Um, the Roger Street Complex also is on the north side of the um, Scott Street Bridge. And that's a very large mm -hmm. piece of property that is used by the streets department of the city and Parks and Rec. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just full of all kinds of different materials. Um, it's used for disposing of street sweeping, debris, um, snow removal, road material, Parks and Rec's um, some materials over there from, from their operations. And so we have that one has been a really big project and what's really exciting about it is it's going to uh, uh, potentially be developed in a mixed use um, development housing affordable housing uh, potentially commercial and parks and so it's pretty exciting and it's near mm -hmm. other developments and other brownfield sites that have been um, cleared for develop redevelopment as well and um, Fish, Wildlife and Parks asked us to do a phase one of Milltown State Park. We did that. Missoula County Public Schools has asked us to do assessments of their old admin building on 6th Street. And if you're familiar with that building, it was built in the early 1900s. It's a very old, beautiful building. Um, I actually worked in it prior to joining the county, so I'm familiar with it. Um, the trustees have asked us to assess what would it, it take to redevelop that site. Um, right now, I don't think there's a lot of idea. There's not a lot known how that site will be redeveloped, but there's a lot of potential. And then um, Missoula County uh, donated some property to Homeward near the detention center off of Mullen Road for development also of affordable housing. And we were able to help Homeward with a phase one to provide that due diligence that they needed for their financing. And um, it's very exciting because they are now able to proceed. And if you've driven by there recently, you'll notice that they've broken ground and it's moving along. So it's that's very exciting. Yes. Willie, do you want to add anything to that? Um, I guess the only thing I would add is that half of these sites were outside the city limits. And we certainly haven't served the whole county but one of them was on county land and the other remaining sites that made up the half were outside the city limits. So there's been there's been a mix and the city's grant, they've had a longstanding brownfields program. We've been working together and um, they've been suggesting sites to us as needed. I think should we win next time with hopefully out the COVID situation that we had last year, we do in-person outreach more along the lines of what's typical for smaller communities in Montana because that's really where you have people mention 
you know, what about that place, Joe's place that had a fire and now it's just sitting there and then we go get to meet Joe. That in-person outreach was difficult during COVID. I think that's part of why. In just in addition to the general vortex of Missoula, you know, pulling funds into it, that it wasn't more widely distributed and we hope to in a future grant widely distribute the funds. Thank you. OK, so on that note, um, as we start thinking about applying for uh, another Brownfields grant, Brownfields assessment grant, uh, we definitely welcome ideas and feedback and thoughts about where we could dedicate funding in the future. Um, and just to kind of address how we determine if a site is eligible as a brownfield. First of all, it has to be real property. It has to be abandoned or underutilized. There needs to be potential for contamination, potential reuse or redevelopment, and very importantly, there need to be willing stakeholders. So we're definitely looking for more sites. Um, last time when we applied, we included several potential brownfield sites in our grant application, some of which we ended up assessing with our funding. Um, we're not beholden to assess those sites. We just mainly need to demonstrate that we know how to develop a program, how to implement the funding, and how to conduct site assessments and identify sites. So we welcome your feedback on any thoughts of where we could be sure to utilize the funding next round. And just to kind of speak to the benefits of uh, Brownfields grants, um, like I said, participation is voluntary. Uh, this is not a regulatory program. Assessments are completed at no or little cost to owners. Um, owners approve all of the work prior to collection of data, so we're collaborating with the owners from the start. Um, all data and reports are provided to owners, which they can use to, um, if they need to respond to a regulatory agency, if that's the case, or they need to finalize a property sale or satisfy lenders. Um, many lenders require these environmental site assessments before a real estate transaction can occur um, to reduce their risk. And so uh, that's oftentimes how these are used. Um, funds could be used to address uh, community concerns. And there are cleanup, there is a cleanup program that the city has. It's a revolving loan fund. Um, as Missoula County develops the Brownfields program, it's ultimately our goal to be able to compete for a revolving loan fund um, funding from the Environmental Protection Agency. So we could also offer that option for cleanup, um, but we still need, we have some work to do to get before we'll get there. There are other funding, potentially funding um, sources too that could be used for cleanup. So there, there are ways to find, to, to do that cleanup. Um, it's competitive, so it's no guarantee, but we can always explore that option. Oh, really needs to tell us about that image. Sorry. Oh, this is the river and cutting on Rail Link Park by the Southgate Mall. <clears throat> that was a former um, rail car painting area that had lead and soil from lead-based paint. So the city did a cleanup and before putting the dog park, the community gardens, the pickleball, and the play structures out there. And so um, that's been a real big public benefit for those of you who know that area. On Franklin to the Fort, it was also the lowest density of parks of any neighborhood and now they have the newest nice park there. Awesome, thank you. I have to say I really like this new um, interface with PowerPoint because before it would cut off part, the video would cut off part of the screen. So well, that's super cool. Um, so that's really all we have. Uh, we're, welcome, we're welcoming comments, questions, feedback, thoughts, any, um, ideas of sites that we need to make sure we include in the next grant application, we, we would welcome that. You're welcome to share that information today or you can email me. Um, email is going to be the best way to reach me because I'm still working from home, if you can't tell. Um, Bert, looks like your hand is up. Can, do I? Yeah, uh, I got two things. One of them is, this is the first time I've ever seen a shared presentation where I could run the slides back and forth and forwards and backwards to see whatever I wanted to see. I don't know how you did that, but that's different. I worked my magic, I guess. Uh, 
Well, good on you. And I the other thing, uh, I just want to confirm with Willie that uh, we still never have gotten anything out of international paper for the uh, for this uh, property down by the Milltown Park. Right. I mean, we we basically learned more about the stalemate that happened between FWP and international paper. And we didn't solve the stalemate or really push it forward at all. Uh, anything that we can do from the Bonner side of it to help move that? I mean, I think just reach out to FWP and International Paper and I'd be willing to help you with that. Um, we, we sort of got a uh, pretty firm uh, statement from the attorney that they wanted to speak on their own behalf, International Paper did, about the history of that site. Okay. We'll see about following up on that later this summer. Yeah, I'm, I'm willing to team with you and approach them anytime. All right, I'm going to be out of town for two or three weeks, and then I'll get back with you. Okay. That's all I had. Sure. Thanks, Bert. Kyla, can you put well, actually, never mind. I guess people have access. I was like, can you put the, the contact info in the chat? Yeah, I can do that. That's a good idea. Great. Well, thanks, Willie and Cindy. Does anyone else have sure. questions? Okay, we're cranking through this. Hegemeyer, mm -hmm. zoning. I need to unshare the screen. Yeah, I'm, oh, thank you. Give Sorry. me a second to figure out how to do that. <laughs> oh, where does it go? Sorry, I'll figure it out. Give me a second. Well, I don't I don't need a presentation, so I'll just start talking. Um, I, I'm not sure if I've met everybody on the call, but so my name is Andrew Hagemeyer. I'm a planner with Missoula County and uh, we have been working on for quite some time an update to Missoula County Zoning Code. And I'm just here today to talk a little bit about uh, the upcoming outreach process that's going to occur around this code. We, as you know, or maybe you don't know, but Missoula County Zoning Code was written in the 1970s. Um, I think it was adopted in 1976. It hasn't it's gone undergone some revisions, but it hasn't undergone any major revisions since that since it was adopted. So we're talking about a zoning code that more or less the bones are 40 plus years old. Um, this is problematic in a number of ways. An example is, uh, uh, you know, we thought a lot differently about housing in the 1970s as we do now. And so our zoning code, unfortunately, can be a, bar a barrier to uh, providing housing for Missoulians. So we're working on updating it and uh, and have been working on it for the better part of two years, if not longer, really. Um, so, you know, just just uh, just for a little bit of edification, a little bit of background in in June of 2019, Missoula County adopted the Missoula Area Land Use Element, which was our land use plan for this for the area, which was just as old as our zoning. And in that process, we, I mean, we held dozens and dozens of community meetings, multiple open houses, workshops. Um, we had online mapping tools. We collected input from, uh, you know, like quite literally thousands of ideas on where and how we should grow in the Missoula Valley. Uh, that plan, uh, that was adopted in June of 19 um, is the foundation for our zoning. Uh, once that was adopted shortly thereafter, actually in the fall is when we started working on our zoning code in the fall of 2019. And we started with the zoning audit where we went through our code and performed an audit, just like you would audit your books. Uh, we audited our code and we there was a, there was a fairly robust public uh, participation process in that audit as well, where we looked for things that were working in our code and things that weren't, weren't working. Things that, uh, you know, maybe we weren't doing that our best, best practice says we should do or vice versa. 
that zoning audit came out in uh, the winter of 2020. And those two documents, the zoning audit and the, the land use element, uh, gave us the information we needed to move forward with the zoning code. So we started to work on a draft in, in 2020 internally, and we've finished writing that draft this spring. And so the summer of 2021, right now, is when we are taking that draft and we're taking it out to the public to get feedback on the draft. You know, we're calling it like a, a public working draft. This is the opportunity for people to get input, provide input on the code outside of a public hearing setting. And this is important to the community councils that are in the Missoula area. So by the community councils in the Missoula area, our zoning code update is really only affecting the areas from Bonner out to the Y, from Miller Creek up to the Rattlesnake. So Bonner, Milltown Community Councils, East Missoula Community Council, and a portion of the West Valley Community Council um, boundaries are within this code update. If you're, if you're from Lolo, uh, there isn't any portion of Lolo Community Council that's being affected by this code update. The Swan, you're not affected. Evro, not affected. Uh, Condon, uh, you know, the Sealy Swan, not affected. So um, that gives you a geographic understanding of what portion of the county is being affected by this zoning update. So I'm hoping within a, a, a week or two, we will be announcing the schedule and um, opportunities for the public outreach process. Uh, to give you an idea of what that pub public outreach process is going to entail, we plan to have um, an online mapping tool where you will be able to go online and you'll be able to look at your current zoning on one side of the screen and the proposed zoning on the other side of the screen and see some general information about how these two are different or the same. So if the zoning is primarily residential, it'll say residential. If it's primarily commercial, it'll say commercial. It will say lot sizes. It will say setbacks. So you'll be able to go in and look up your, your property um, and just generally see how, you know, it, it, how much change is occurring on your property. It might be very, you might see very little change, if none uh, at all, but you might be, you, some properties might see a uh, significant amount of change. Uh, we believe that 90% of the people that interact with this project are just going to want to see how the zoning is affecting their property. Uh, and, and then they'll decide whether or not they want to uh, engage in the project at all. So this online mapping tool is a really important part of our outreach process. That's actually what's hanging us up right now. It's a, it's a complicated uh, website we're building and our GIS guy Andrew Stickney who's really really smart and really really good with these things is figuring it out but it's taking a while and we're really close so we're hoping in the next two weeks um, to have a press release to announce that we're also going to have a comment tool for the code itself so you'll be able to go in and uh, leave a comment in the code for us uh, you know if you like something or don't like something or want to see something changed um, you can, while you're looking through the code, you can just plock in, plump in a comment right there in the code and it, and it will show up for us. So those are the, and of course, then you can just, we also have a comment tool where you could just leave a general comment. So that's sort of our, our website based comment. We're also going to be doing um, online events. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pick a topic, say housing or uh, riparian setbacks, and we'll have a workshop specifically on that topic. And we're planning to do about five to six of those topics um, starting in July and running through August. Uh, we'll also have open house events. So these will be in-person opportunities to come meet with the planners and talk with us about what is in the code and what, what you'd like to see in the code. Um, and those will commence probably sometime in late July and run through August. And uh, our game plan right now is to have one in the Bonner Milltown area out at the barn, um, have one in the East Missoula area, and then have one on the west side of Missoula, probably an orchard home or target range. And then we would also probably have one downtown um, for the folks, you know, who uh, maybe work in, in the Missoula core, and that one would probably be during the day. Um, 
then we during this we'll be meeting with stakeholders uh so uh an example of a stakeholder in this process would be the bonner milltown community council so uh bert heads up we're hoping to come to be on your agenda in july if you're having a meeting please tell me you're having a meeting in july uh, uh yeah we're having great. a meeting in july great right. we are on the agenda then put us uh, on there and it's, uh, it's the agenda is booked full so okay well uh <laughs> Give yes. us 10 minutes then. <laughs> oh, you got, you got it. That's okay. All right. Um, so uh, we'll be coming. So, you know, the opportunity there, Bert, is then we can just let everybody know to come to the to the open house in that case. And then we'll come back to you in, in, in August as well, if you're having a meeting in August. No. Um, so not. stakeholder, stakeholder meetings, uh, we can, uh, you know, that includes organizations like the Missoula Realtors, the Clark Fork Coalition, the typical groups in Missoula that get really involved in these land use discussions. Uh, we're also holding workshops with our planning board. These are public workshops. The plan where we're directly engaging our planning board, and that will occur throughout the summer. And we've got a steering committee that is a, as a group of people that are really involved in codes in Missoula, and they're there. We've been meeting with them for months, and we'll continue to do so for the summer. So just to give you a little recap on what went into the draft um, that we're looking at today, this is the public draft. This is our chance to engage with it before we go to public hearings. We will we will collect input, we will revise the draft, and then we will take it to public hearings. Uh, it, the Missoula area land use element went into it, and all of that comment, all of that engagement that we went through in that process. The recommendations from the zoning audit, which can be found online input from steering committees input from staff and agencies we've we have engaged agencies already on this process and then public input stakeholder input and planning board input and all of that will form the draft that we send to the planning board sometime in october maybe even september if we're real good um the whole goal is to have this thing wrapped up new code adopted in effect in late late 2021 early 2022 any questions i mean i just talked a tiny little bit about the code i mean i just talked about process <laughs> i didn't even talk about the code i mean we could talk forever but i just wanted to talk about the process today lee looks like you have your hand up yes thank you hey andrew i missed the last of the Board of Adjusters meeting the other night, and you brought this up there, perhaps? I'm, my question specifically is about setbacks. Are you doing away with setbacks then? There, in, in, in some zones, yes, and other zones, no. So you will not see setbacks in our neighborhood commercial or community commercial zones but you will see setbacks and things like live make residential you, you will still have setbacks in those locations actually i take that back i'm wrong there are setbacks in community commercial neighborhood commercial which is supposed to be like a little downtown you can't get a downtown if you have setbacks doesn't work impossible to build so you if you want to have like a little downtown you need to get rid of setbacks OK, so which zoning is that in that is, has no setbacks? Neighborhood commercial, which would in, in East Missoula would be along the Highway 200 corridor. And in the Bonner Milltown area, um, uh, a little bit in Milltown, a little bit in Milltown, um, where the store is today. Um, and uh, a little bit of long Highway 200 across from Town Pump. Okay, so my, what are setbacks specifically? Setbacks are just a it's a it's a number, uh, ten feet, fifteen feet, it's a distance, a numerical distance that says uh, you have your building has to be set back from the property line by by this much. And so it, it's a it's a little bit of an archaic standard in the fact that uh, 
you know, zoning was originally created back in the 1920s to separate use. So everything in zoning tried to keep things apart. Um, and today we still we still do that. There are public health and safety reasons to keep things separate, especially in single family residential buildings because um, they don't have the fire standards for fire separation. So if you allowed zero lot line setbacks and on a single family home, uh, you it, 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 it's a fire separation issue and it could complicate building permits, but not, not a deal breaker. Um, but in our in in other zones uh, where you have more commercial uses and you want to create a walkable environment, um, those distances um, actually separate buildings out, and so they make it so it's not a walkable place. It makes it makes building um, Higgins Avenue illegal. Setback you could not build Higgins Avenue if in downtown Missoula if you had setbacks. However, if you have a neighborhood and you have setbacks from the street, you have a straight line of front of houses and it looks nice and neat. Yeah, and so you do, you, we still have setbacks in some districts where that's appropriate. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and I guess I was specifically wondering about the proposal there, the triangle, talking about removing all those setbacks on Michigan and, Col on, and Clyde Street, which in our viewpoint, causes some problems with parking and visibility. Since our streets are so narrow in East Missoula, they're, you know, they're noticeably narrower than what is the standard. We're 50 foot rather than the 60 foot. Yeah, um, so, you know, in, a, in, in that situation, there's also an element called of in, in the code, in the zoning code, and it's also in building permits a clear vision triangle is what it's called and so it would allow it would require that buildings not inhibit um the, when you come up to an intersection not inhibit the view from around the corner but um i think i think the you know the right of way is 60 feet. The road's not 60 feet. The road's much right. smaller. And so there's a setback in effect from where the road is to, to the building. Um, so the building's not gonna be right up against the road like you might imagine. Uh, it, and uh, you know, there's setbacks have nothing to do with parking at all. So having setbacks or not having setbacks doesn't affect parking. There's no correlation. You, if parking is required, you still have to have parking, whether whether you have setbacks or don't. Okay, I guess I need to understand setbacks more and I did miss that portion of the meeting that you spoke at. It's just the distance between the property line and the building. That's what the setback means. Okay. Yep. Thank you for clarifying. Yep. Yeah. Right, we'll talk more about that, Lee. I got to give you a call here this week, anyways. So. I'd love that. Yep. Any other questions for Andrew? Wow. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much, Andrew. Yep. And, uh, Good, good luck in July. And with this, uh, this is a, this is a fast process. Fantastic. Well, it's it's going to feel fast, but we've been working on it forever. And there's already, so much input has already gone into it. So exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, now we're on to um, general updates. Kyla, you want to start sure. us off? Um, why don't we go ahead and start with West Valley? I think Tom hopped on. Great. Well, I don't really have anything. Okay, is there anyone from the Swan? I don't think I saw anyone on. 
Next would be Seely. Um, Tom wasn't able to join us today, um, Tom Browder, but he did want me to share one, two items. Um, one, they voted that they're not going to be meeting in um, June, July, or August, and they're hoping to meet back up in September due to the busy tourist season. And then they just wanted to express appreciation to Jordan Lyons for joining their June meeting um, uh, and the discussion that they had about affordable housing. So that was from Tom up in Sealy. Um, Lolo, I don't, is Kevin on? No. Yeah, I didn't see him on either. Um, I guess Lee, let's see you, East Missoula. Hi there. Um, all I have to say is that we do not meet in June, July, or August, and that's been traditional for us. Unfortunately, we do have a topic that's pretty hot and heavy with the fireworks stands and the fireworks going on. We do not have any ordinances, nor do I know how to do that. So, um, again, that's a, one of those pressing immediate concerns. And I've got a resident who is working on getting the school system to protect Mount Jumbo School from having fireworks on site of that property. Other than that, we approached this subject last year and it kind of got out of hand. So it was dropped and walked away from. And now that it's revisited, it's happening more civilly. Our fireworks haven't really started just yet. I know we're going to be okay now. Like it can be tonight for all I know. I know it's a real hazard and safety concern with the extreme temperatures we're due in for next week. And I don't know if there's anything the county can do to possibly put a temporary stop on fireworks in the county because of that reason. As Max pointed out, we don't have, uh, as of Monday, it may very likely be that our burn season is ended until the fall. I'm wondering if there's anything that can be done about fireworks during this immediate couple weeks. Well, um, I think Chris is there. Chris is on, and I'm I'm punting to him. Is there anything that the any authority the county has? So the county does not have the authority to regulate fireworks. Um, but however, that being said, that. Forest Service and DNRC do usually close uh, their areas to fireworks to try and help with that um, during this time of year. Um, we, of course, do do emergency proclamations and recommend against their use um, during those times. But unfortunately, statutorily, we don't have authority to regulate fireworks in the county, unlike the city. It is one of the challenges with limited powers government that we keep running into. Well, Thank you. If you have any suggestions on anything I can do to discourage firework use, I'd be all ears. Keep talking to your neighbors. That's, it'll be a, a cultural change. <laughs> yeah. That's all I got to say from East Missoula, really, at this time. We got a whole bunch of stuff going on with zoning matters and property sales, all that sort of thing that impacts us greatly. So we're keeping our nose to the fire, even though we're not meeting. We might be having some special meetings over the summer. Thanks, Lee. And then we're on to Bonner Milltown first, or Emily. Well, yeah, just leave the best for last. That's all I can say. Uh, I got three or four things. One of them is uh, the smoke presentation that was put together uh, for the last all community council meeting was great. We had it again the following night at the Bonner Milltown Council. And then the following Tuesday, I had her visit with uh, a coffee group that I've got about 15 or 20 of us that meet on Tuesday mornings. And uh, it was well represented. It was well accepted and received in all three places. So kudos on that. Uh, then uh, the Bonner Milltown Council will be down in August. Uh, we we don't have a tradition. We randomly pick a month and when everybody's not going to be there. So 
August is the month for that one. And two things are happening in Bonner. Uh, one, uh, it's hit the newspaper a few times, and that's the big uh, controlled waste pile in the middle of the Bonner Mill. It covers about 2.3 acres and 20 feet tall. It is now about 40% gone and should be completely gone by the end of July. So uh, that will clean up a, a problem for the uh, Department of Quality and, and Environmental Quality, and it'll create a, a significant opportunity for the owners of the Bonner Mill, which will also hopefully increase the dollar value of the TIF and what we can do with that money later. And the other one is that the, the Bonner houses on the more or less northwest side of Highway 200 are up for uh, subdivision review right now. They are all in one lot uh, that was owned by the mill. And they're breaking them up into 19 separate housing lots so that they can sell them. Other than that, uh, Rick, Emily, that's all I got. I got nothing to add. You completed it very well. Thank you. I just thank you as every month that we do this. Some great information out there and I appreciate it. Oh, Rick, you're muted. Try again. I think he's talking to himself. Rick, you're mm -hmm. muted. So. Okay. He actually unmuted himself, but I don't know. Never can tell. I think maybe his keyboard mute button is down. But anyway, uh, Juanita, it's uh, it's been a uh, glad to see at least one commissioner show up for this. Thank you. Well, the other other two wish they could be here, but hey, we got this puppy done in an hour. Yeah, I know. I was in a meeting with Josh earlier this afternoon. So. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone. Have a lovely Wednesday evening. I, I, I think we need to look at something. Uh, maybe we need to look at something and see what it is that has gotten it down to only two uh, councils at this meeting for the last two meetings, or three. I'm sorry, three. Um, we've got what well, we got seven councils, five of which are active. I think we ought to see if we can, you know, get them in. This is a good meeting. Yeah, we haven't seen Lolo in a, in a in a bit. Right. We can uh, we can we can harass them. Okay. <laughs> right. We'll reach out and do some more for next month. Okay. What do you say, Rick? My mic is working now. Yes. Hey, just in time to say goodbye. Goodbye. Nothing from me. Okay. <laughs> Have a great evening. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.